Awesome. As I said, we're going to give it another couple minutes and let people kind of load in. But if you want to let us know where you're calling in from, that'd be awesome. I see a lot of people calling in from places that have winter. I got to admit, it's like 70 degrees here today. <laughs> <laughs> the Santa Ana's are blowing pretty strong, though. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so I also have a poll that just kind of lets us know um, really what experience or profession um, we're talking to everybody here. Um, I apologize, I didn't put an other. So if it doesn't apply to any of those, just don't select it. But we want to make sure that some of what we talk about today is relevant to everybody joining us and can address any questions or talk about any topics that people are interested in. So it looks like we've got a good amount of professional brewers, brewery professionals, um, non-brewers, a couple beer geeks, and then a couple home brewers as well. Awesome. So a couple uh, housekeeping items before we start here. Um, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A box. It's a little bit easier to monitor. Um, we'll try to get to them as we go through some of this conversation. Um, but if it's um, not pertinent to what we're speaking about in the moment, we're going to save it to the end, but we will try to get to everything. Uh, this session is being recorded and will be available on the White Labs YouTube channel um, sometime in the next 24 hours. So to introduce myself, my name is Eric Fowler. I'm the Education and Brewery Experience Manager here at White Labs. Um, and I wanted to thank you, Mitch, for joining today. Um, I'm really excited to, to talk to the um, IPA expert and somebody who's <laughs> brewed a lot of the beers that I've personally enjoyed and some of the beers that really um, sparked my passion in, in craft beer and in, into the industry. Did you want to introduce yourself and say a little bit about who you are and where you come from? Sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, glad to be here. Uh, my name is Mitch Steele. I, I've been in the brewing business since the late 1980s, so pretty long time. I've seen a lot of things change over the years. I've worked with a lot of different breweries. Um, probably, uh, you know, my my most notable stint was my 10 years at Stone uh, in Escondido, California. Uh, got to do a lot of really neat things when I was with Stone. Had a lot of creative freedom. Uh, the brewery grew from about 40,000 barrels to about 400,000 barrels in the 10 years I was there. So it was very exciting time and, and really optimistic about craft beer. And I joined New Realm Brewing in Atlanta uh, in 2016 uh, and uh, been with New Realm now for four, uh, over four years. Uh, and we've been open for over three years now. And it's been a, a pretty interesting ride, you know, dealing with the changing landscape of, of beer in the United States and everything else is going on in, in this country and in the world has really impacted the way we, we look at the business. But uh, having a good time here, we're, we're making a lot of beers. I, I'm brewing a lot more beers here that I would not have brewed at Stone. So we're doing some classic German lagers and uh, things like that that you know weren't weren't on the playlist at Stone, but uh, they certainly are here. And we've got a restaurant in Atlanta and a restaurant in Virginia Beach, so they're very, very uh, fun places to go visit. And you know, there's always a good selection of beer on uh, different types of beer in each location. Yeah, that's awesome. They're definitely on my list of somewhere to try to hit up in 2020, <laughs> and that didn't happen. But yeah. uh, you might not recall, but I helped open Stone J Street. And one of my favorite oh. experiences there was um, I worked for Chuck Alec Independent Brewers prior to that. Okay. A little nano brewery up in Ramona who did historic classic styles. And yeah, I remember uh, them. Yeah. Yeah. And Grant got to brew uh, with Ketchum. I think it was a Liberty Station beer. I remember uh, that. Historic yeah. Historic <laughs> Porter. And you, you guys came down and it was, it was super cool. And we've done it. We did a couple things before Chuck Alec closed some other historic beers. Maybe we'll tie that into some of the, the content. Later, yeah, that, but, that was fun. I remember that. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty cool being able to pour, you know, my previous brewery's beer at the, the new brewery I was working at. So yeah, cool. That was pretty fun. And Ketchum always got to do the, still gets to do the fun stuff. So, um, you know, what we're going to talk about today is obviously going to be really IPA heavy. Um, this webcast series has evolved over the last year and uh, really opened it up to viewing fermentation through the lens of many aspects of beer. 
you know, it's really easy when we're working with yeast propagation and our analytical lab and, and teaching people how to use yeast day in and day out and just trying to get that side of who White Labs is um, out into the market and out into brewers' hands. But there's, but fermentation affects almost every position within the industry, uh, every beer style. So what we've been able to do is kind of hyper-focus a little bit on whether it's managing a sensory panel and how fermentation characteristics and attributes might be taught through that, or, you know, speaking with the Cicerone program and saying, how does fermentation play a role in what you teach when it comes to beer service? So I'm really excited today to look at IPA through the lens of fermentation because a lot of, you know, a, a lot of what's sexy about IPAs is always the hot profile, right? But really what it comes down to is the, the technology and the microbiology behind these beer styles that I, I would argue have played such a drastic role in making what it is today. So maybe you could briefly even describe uh, and this is a very a big question, but uh, what the IPA style is to you, and then we can talk more in later slides on, on how it keeps changing. Like, what's the overall, if somebody's never had an IPA before, how do you describe it to somebody? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, because it has morphed a lot in its history into very distinct styles. I, to me, an IPA is all about hops. And so if I were asked to describe what an IPA is to uh, somebody who wasn't familiar with the style or wasn't familiar with, with beer styles in general, I would say, you know, hops are one of the, one of the four ingredients in most beers and an IPA has more hops than any other style. And, you know, and that contributes a lot to the bitterness and to the um, aromatic flavors and, and taste of the beer. Uh, and so if you wanna taste a particular hop or you wanna understand what hops bring to beer an IPA is a great place to start. Yeah, totally. And I think that's what consumers have learned to ex expect. And I think there's been um, some negatives associated with that too. And you know, when we start talking about some of the more recent versions of IPAs, you know, again, going back to Stone, being next to the ballpark, you know, everybody would come in and say, I, I don't like hoppy things. I don't like hoppy things. Like, no, you don't like bitter beers. You know, we had yep. go-to IPA that was awesome and changing the way you describe that a little bit and not emphasizing the, the bitter aspect that hops contribute and the, the floral aromatics and the citrus-like aromas like changed people's opinion drastically. But I think, you know, it was sold for a long time in craft beer that this is the most bitter beer you've ever had. And it turned <laughs> a lot of people off because of it. Yeah, it, it certainly did. And I certainly experienced that in Atlanta. Uh, you know, they, uh, uh, by and large, uh, there are a lot of beer drinkers here who really don't appreciate bitter beers and don't like them. And we had to kind of shift gears when we first started uh, because of that. And do you, do you see that as you know, just regional preferences, like, is that, does that resonate with like, you know, culinary preferences or was there just certain products that maybe turned the market off of bitter beers? No, I think it's more of a regional preference thing. And I think, you know, to your point, I think it's influenced by what foods people eat and drink um, in addition to beer. And, you know, um, uh, you know, it's interesting because bitterness is is a flavor that most people feel that humans evolved to dislike because it usually indicated that whatever they were eating was was not going to be good for them, right? And and sugar was the exact opposite, very pleasing to the palate because sugar has a lot of energy and a lot of things that really contribute to to um, you know uh, the survival of the of the human being and you know so it's it, bitterness is definitely a learned taste and i think there's a definite definite lean towards more bitter on the west coast than what i've seen on the east coast doesn't mean that people on the east coast don't like bitter beers but i think um you know i think by and large they drink things that are a little bit less bitter than a west coast ipa yeah, that, that makes sense. And in my time spent on the East Coast, you know, I, I spent a couple of years, so we went through all the seasons and I, I grew an appreciation for seasonality and what I consumed a lot more than I do living in San Diego, even 
moving back. I still want IPAs all year, but you know, changing of, of the seasons. I remember the first time working with somebody, they said, oh, it's almost whiskey weather. And I'm like, well, what are you talking about whiskey weather? And it's like, as soon as it drops below 40, it starts, you know, pulling out a nice bottle of whiskey and drinking it neat. And it's, uh, you know, there's, there's something to be said for that. And yeah. I think, you know, historically we see a lot of that too. And, and seasonality and brewing conditions and available resources, but also just preferences on wanting something to be hearty and keep somebody warm. Uh, so we'll also look at how technological and, and scientific advances have shaped IPA and then just the our most important and our favorite microorganism Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So maybe we could start by talking about um, early IPAs and you know maybe even when that was when it was first mentioned because a, a lot of what we have to go off of is what's written about, right? What historic beer recipes we see, or more importantly, what advertisements we see, or when we start seeing it mentioned in publications. Uh, you want to take a stab at just kind of laying the foundation of when IPA was introduced? Yeah, so the, the beer that became IPA, that most, most people agree that that was a pale ale that was being shipped to India primarily um, by the Bow Brewery in London, England. And they never called it an IPA. I mean, this was like the, the mid to late 1700s. And it went until about 1826 or 1830 before the term India Pale Ale even came up in advertisements or in any sort of documentation about the beer. It was always referred to as a pale ale. Um, and then it became a pale ale for India, you know, and then it just kind of evolved over uh, many years. But, you know, it was, um, uh, you know, the big thing, uh, big developments in the brewing industry that really contributed to this beer were the development of pale malt, uh, which happened about 100 years earlier. And then uh, British expansion, you know, and imperialism and, and having to ship their beers all around the world. And you know, it, it, one of the big myths is that IPA was the only beer that survived the voyage. And that that is absolutely not true. Um, but IPA is the one that became associated with with exporting to India uh, because it was a very popular beer. Um, Scottish brewers shipped a lot of porter to India and and their troops liked IPA and they liked porter. But, um, you know, there's a, it, the big things that defined that beer in that period. It's, it was very light in color, which was unusual for the time. It did have a pretty high hop load and a high bitterness. And then, um, you know, it, you see the picture of the Burton Union system here. The Burton breweries started getting involved in IPA brewing in the 1820s. And they were trying at first trying to replicate uh, the beer from the Bow Brewery, and then they started, you know, doing their own thing with it, and and really developed a method to make extremely pale malt. Uh, they undersized their kettles in the breweries so that the vo the boil wouldn't be too vigorous and generate a lot of color. So the paleness and the lightness in color of this beer was a was a defining aspect as we moved into the 1800s. Were they still doing? prolonged boils like you saw in a lot of other English beers for the IPA. I mean, it wasn't uncommon to hear about those 12 hour boils. Yeah, no, it, they didn't uh, because that developed too much color. So, you know, I think uh, I'd have to go back and look at the recipes and see if they even mention the boil time. But um, I, I, you know, my suspicion and my expectation is that the times would be somewhere in between one and two hours. Um, you know, and it, well, the other thing to consider there is that also they were uh, most of these brewers were partagile brewing, so they were they were brewing a batch of mash and then separating the worts out and boiling them separately based on gravities, and so they'd end up with three different strength worts, and then they would blend those back together to create the base wort for whatever beers they wanted to make. And uh, if you ever get a chance to go to the Fuller's Brewery in London, they're probably one of the last brewers that is using that method. And they make, you know, two or three brands from each batch of, of mash that they mash in. Yeah, that's awesome. The, the commitment sometimes when it's mm -hmm. obviously more difficult, but it's the way they've been doing it for so long. Uh, looking at those 
those beers that were brewed hundreds of years ago, do you think, kind of a two-part question, do you think that they were heavily inspired by some of the lighter colored lagers that were seen about the same time? Or was that technology uh, independently beginning to be used in England? You know, actually, <clears throat> the lagers were inspired by the pale ales of England. And there's there's some references in and, and documents that indicate that there were brewers, uh, a couple of brewers from from Central Europe went to England for the express purpose of learning how to make this pale malt, and and so I you know my my position is that the, the English pale ales and IPAs came before uh, the light colored lagers from Europe, uh, and you know it was considered a spy mission, and there's a there's a lot of fun stories about it if people want to research it. I I don't remember all the particulars, but I remember kind of going, okay, this, this stuff was going on back then too. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> um, you know, I, I see, you know, working, working for Chuck Alec, who focused so heavily on historic beer styles, it was difficult to mimic based off of the ingredients that are available today. Um, obviously, there was a lot of brown malt used for some of those historic porters and milds and all that. And we yeah. can't really find the same brown malt today. Uh, but I, it's, it always, the more research I did, it uh, kind of led me to believe that a lot of those beers probably weren't very good. If you, if you were to be transported back then, what would you expect those beers to actually taste like, especially after aging for sometimes upwards of a year, right? Now we want beers two weeks old. It starts to seem like, oh, this is not fresh anymore. Yeah, it's completely different, isn't it? I, you know, I, there was a widespread practice of blending fresh beer with aged beers, uh, you know, back then in the in the taverns and pubs, and you know, so you probably got a pretty mixed bag as far as flavor profiles. But I would expect you'd you'd see a little bit of smokiness in a lot of the beers. You'd see some tartness for sure, and maybe some some funk. You know, I, I think one of the most interesting things that I learned in researching IPA was that these these yeast cultures that were used by these British brewers weren't pure cultures. They didn't even understand what that yeast was a living organism at the time, and so they just collected the yeast and reused it. You know, like like a lot of brewers still do, uh, but you know when that yeast when we finally developed the technology to analyze what was in those cultures in the, in the, this number of strains that were in there, there were like seven or eight different yeast strains in British yeast cultures, including Britannomyces. So it's, I think it's a fair, a logical leap to make that most of these beers, when they had some age on them, uh, started developing some funky characters. And uh, certainly the India Pale Ale, which was aged for one to two years before it even got to India in wood barrels, uh, would have been subject to some Britannomyces activity. And, and when it was in India and tasting good, people described it as champagne-like, which I think adds a little bit of credence to that, that hypothesis. Yeah, that's that's Definitely interesting and, and something that I've often thought about is, you know, most beers were probably somewhat contaminated, depending on how you're looking at the, the definition of contamination. Yeah. But uh, being that those early beers were really reliant on a lot of the pubs cellaring them and managing them and, and determining when's the right time to serve them, how did the transport of those, were they just did they have somebody managing those as they were being transported or would they just show up and people probably did the best they could and were happy to have something from home? You know, it's, um, it, it, it's kind of hard to say. I think, you know, initially the East India company did all the shipping of beer uh, over to, to India and, you know, so they knew the drill, I guess, is probably the best way to put it. And and what the brewers did is they'd ship, they'd put the beer in barrels fairly early on in its life. And they'd ship the barrels to the port city. So they'd ship barrels to Liverpool or London um, or some other town, you know, that was on the coast that, that boats uh, departed from. And they would store there for you know, a year to 18 months, 
outside of the brewery and they had people there managing the aging process. They would pull the bungs in the summer when it heated up and the beer started fermenting again. Um, you know, their goal was to make sure the beer was absolutely flat by the time it got put on a boat so that the cask wouldn't explode. And, you know, having these multiple staged fermentations really helped with that. But so it was watched very carefully up until the time it got onto a boat. And I don't really have a good idea of how it was managed on the boat or how it was managed once it got to India. Hmm. Was it, and you might not know the answer to this question, but was it likely or common for them to send some of these beers out west to some of the colonies or were they just relying on the abundant resources that we had here in the Americas? So in, in the United States, it was a combination of both. Um, you know, it, uh, you know, I think uh, when it, you know, before the American independence, I think a lot of the beers uh, came, came from England, probably more so than after uh, the revolution. Um, and a lot of, there were a lot of breweries on the East Coast in the 1800s that were making India pale ales that were modeled after the British versions. I think an interesting thing is, is that the, the British brewers were shipping India pale ale all over the place. So it wasn't all just going to India. It was, it was going to the United States. A lot of it went to Australia. Um, you know, basically anywhere where the British had colonies, they were shipping beer to. So, um, you know, that's, uh, and the American brewers on the East Coast, by and large, were were British and modeling themselves after British brewers. And so they were trying to do the same thing with the beer that the folks in England were doing. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, it's, you know, you just hear so much about the European expansion that you don't really hear too often about, or maybe it's not well documented, but some of the early brewing um, in the United States and you know, as our culture developed and, and saw the regionality of it and all of the influence from different cultures and different immigration patterns, it's been kind of cool to see how that that changed. Um, when it comes to, to brewing IPA, just to touch on the, the union system um, real quick, there's always a lot of really cool British brewing techniques that have kind of faded away, right? Like even just seeing, um, big Yorkshire squares. And, you know, every time I'm at Sierra Nevada, I'm just amazed by everything they do. But, <laughs> uh, you know, the the Mills River location has, you know, their little pilot system that has some open fermenters right out front with yep. yeast troughs and all that. And um, maybe you could just briefly touch on, you know, what some of those systems were and if they were just used for IPA or if they were used for everything that they were brewing. And what what the advantages and disadvantages of them may have been? Yeah, it's um, it, it was you know most of these methods, Yorkshire squares and the Burton Union system, were all about getting healthy yeast off of the fermentation for repitching the next batches, and and so different brewers developed different systems for doing that, but most of them involved some sort of collection process at the top of the tank you know with the yorkshire square i think they had like a hole in this in the ceiling and then kind of collected yeast in the in a in a big uh, uh you know rectangular or square vessel uh that sat on top of the tank you know that may have been part of the tank uh the burton union system uh you can see in the picture here you have the big casks uh, and they would do the primary, they would do a primary, well, I don't know what they did back then, but I know I went through the Marston's Brewery uh, when I was writing the book and they told me exactly what they did. And they, they go through a primary fermentation for a few days uh, in a tank and then they transfer everything into these, into these large barrels. And then you see the swan neck coming out of the top of the barrel and dumping into that trough that's laying on top of those. And as the, as the beer fermented, the yeast you know, the healthy top cropping yeast would just push up into that swan neck and then into the trough and then they collect the yeast and use it for uh, use it for brewing again. And that was how they propagated their yeast and how they repitched it. And I think, you know, for and the thing that was interesting, you know, is, you know, with top fermenting yeast and, and all the verbiage that that's around that and what it really means. Um, in my mind, that, this is what it really means. This is, they're collecting the yeast from the top of the vessel and using that to repitch. So they're selecting for 
yeast strains that tend to rise to the top a little bit more than others, you know, and um, it's, it's fascinating to see. I, I, you know, I think, I don't know if Marston's is the last brewery doing this or if even if they're still doing it, but it was pretty cool to see. They were one of the few breweries I've been to in England that still had a Cooper on their staff, you wow. know, and he was in charge of making those barrels and he's a neat guy, you know, we had a great conversation and uh, there's a picture of him in the book, but uh, yeah, I think it's, it's all about collecting yeast. And, you know, even now as brewers, you know, it, it, one of the things that was drilled into me in my time at Anheuser-Busch when I was running a fermentation cellar is you're growing yeast. You're not, you know, you're not just fermenting beer, you're growing yeast and you've got to look at it that way uh, when you're managing a brewery. Yeah, completely. And we've seen, you know, a lot of challenges. I think a lot of people assume that most strains are true top cropping strains, but not all strains have been really been domesticated for that feature, right? And right. and the equipment that we're using with, you know, conical vessels is, are designed to push that yeast to the bottom. So what we've seen over the last couple of years is just a, a lot of inquiries on harvesting, you know, first it was harvesting from highly hopped West Coast IPAs. And now it's trying to harvest from hazy IPAs that are people want to dry hop mid fermentation and what the balance of that is and, and how they're actually selecting yeast for uh, consistent subsequent batches is just uh, an interesting conversation because it's not something new, right? You could look at those, yeah. those brewing systems from hundreds of years ago and they were still going through the same they're conceptually the same processes and trying to achieve the same results. So yep. it's always something to be learned. <laughs> uh, but, you know, kind of tying into that, you know, there is um, one of the key factors is uh, micro microbiological stability. So, you know, we kind of touched on most beers or a lot of beers due to not really having a control of what's in those yeast cultures and how to best maintain and manage them uh, with coupled with longevity of storage and getting those secondary fermentations from some of those organisms, because you can have great tasting beer that does have contaminating organisms, but if it's consumed very quickly, you're not going to notice that. And I think that's why, you know, serving beer over a bar and having full control over that's the best way to manage a brewery if you can, because I mean, as you know, because just distributing is just a pain and it's difficult and managing that quality from states, states away is, is really hard because you don't know what somebody's going to do. So that beer needs to be very stable when it leaves your brewery. But, you know, if, if you don't have that level of control and you can serve it over the bar, you have a lot more control on, on tasting that beer and seeing if any of these secondary characteristics uh, appeared. So, yeah. You know, one of the big changes was in um, the 1880s, I believe 1883, when uh, Emil Christian Hansen was able to isolate the first pure um, yeast culture. And that was at the Carlsberg um, lab in Copenhagen. We actually have a, a lab in Copenhagen now who works on oh, cool. a lot of our innovation and uh, kind of ties in. I, you know, I half think it's because it's a, it's a great location for serving European craft breweries, but I, I half think it's, um, you know, just trying to be part of this continuing advancing fermentation sciences and, and paying homage almost to um, some of those, those early advancements. But, you know, being able to isolate uh, yeast for the first time away from those other organisms and more importantly, determining, um, it was Louis Pasteur who determined that, um, you know, bacteria was the, the main cause of souring or um, acidifying and turning, turning beer and wine, uh, spoiling it. And being able to isolate the, the strain you want, which is what they're trying to do with those Burton systems the whole time, right? As you said, yeah. there's a lot of yeast in there, but the yeast that's really healthy, most active is going to, become the dominant organism in that culture, you're gonna have a lot more of it than these other organisms. Hopefully the other ones don't have as much flavor impact and hopefully you can capture a lot of that and reuse it and keep it healthy. And it's, it's so amazing that they were able to do that to where we still use those yeast strains today and they still work well. Um, you know, when we're looking at them, 
you know, a lot of the strains that we list as in kind of tying to why, why I was asking about those early English beers coming to the United States or, you know, pre-United States uh, to the colonies was we've done a lot of um, genetic sequencing of our catalog and of different yeast strains. And what we've seen is the American strains are fairly unique and they, they stem from a lot of English strains um, genetically, but they're, they've been here long enough that they've um, began to change their genetic makeup and adapt to a lot of the conditions that we've used them in. So they're different enough, meaning that they've been here for hundreds of years. When you look at the, the genetic tree that they are, are similar enough where you can see where they've come from, but different enough that you can classify them in their own category, which is really interesting because yeah. I would have initially thought that, you know, all of those strains are, you know, it's just a, a British strain that somebody in a catalog named Chico or California 001 or what have you, and somebody just on a piece of paper and a marketing genius changed it. But genetically, those strains are fairly different than their English counterparts. Yeah, that's really interesting. And, um, you know, the origin of yeast is is something that's I think is fascinating because it was so, you know, obviously very regional and and a lot of natural selection took place before people really learned what yeast was um, and and what it contributed to beer and what kind of things to look for. So it's um, it, it's fascinating that you're doing that work. I I think it's really interesting stuff. Yeah, I think it all, you know, it, it ties together and paints a, a larger picture because each one of these components components, each of these advances in technology and somebody brewing a new beer style nobody's ever heard of or using a, a different ingredient in a process all connects the dots on why, right? We know a lot of when, yeah. but we don't always know why. Yeah. So, you know, bringing us to, you know, say the 1970s and beyond, um, the more American IPA, the more style that we uh, define IPA as now you know, still being very different 40, 50 years ago now than it is today. But, mm -hmm. you know, we would argue as a yeast company <laughs> uh, that a lot of that is is highly influenced by the strain or strains that were, were used. Um, you want to talk about some of those early kind of pre-craft uh, IPAs or just hoppy sure. pale beers? Yeah, it's, um, you know, prohibition did so much damage to the beer industry in this country and, and the repercussions went on for decades. Um, you know, Ballantyne IPA was one of the few really hoppy beers that survived, you know, and, and I think before prohibition, we saw kind of a dichotomy where you had on the East Coast, you had a lot of ale brewers and then in the middle of the country, um, you know, with a German influence, you were getting a lot of lager brewers and they were kind of neck and neck up until prohibition, but the German lager brewers are the ones that survived prohibition. And, you know, and as beer tastes changed and as people's overall tastes changed, you know, the lager became a very important style uh, for most of the 1900s. But, you know, Ballantine IPA is one of those hoppy beers that survived. And I, I think it was Michael Jackson, who, uh, the beer writer, who said that Ballantine IPA was the l most authentic English historical IPA that he had ever had, which I thought was a really cool statement. And uh, when, I was, when I was writing the book, I, I got to interview Mark Carpenter uh, from Anchor and also Ken Grossman from Sierra Nevada. And they both told me that Ballantine IPA was their inspiration for doing their hoppy beers. And, um, you know, the Anchor, Anchor Ale strain is a pretty clean fermenter. Um, and, and of course, Sierra Nevada strain is, is a very clean fermenter as well. So the hop character is accentuated and, and more pronounced using those, those yeast strains. Um, I think you know the you know the use of American hops in all three of the beers that are on this slide. I think is important too. You know the the Ballantine uh, used uh, steam distilled hop oil from Bullion hops. Uh, Liberty Ale was Cascade. I think I don't think it was Cascade as first version. I think it was the second version. And of course, Sierra Nevada Pale Ale is a very Cascade heavy beer, and and Celebration Ale is very heavy on the um, uh, Cascade and Centennial, I believe, but, you know, just that classic American hop character that came to define IPA got that, 
got their start by using this clean yeast and also using those kind of hops. Yeah, I think it's definitely, you know, a, a benchmark of the style. Um, we've seen hop character change so much over the decades and, and not focusing as heavily on those classic American hops, all the sea hops that, you know, really brought the style or made the style accessible to a large amount of people. But we've started seeing the South African, all the Southern Hemisphere hops that are a little bit more fruit forward. But the, but what we still see is, you know, that, that clean yeast strain. When we say clean, we mean something that's not, doesn't, it's not very expressive. It doesn't put out a lot of um, flavor compounds. So it's not, it's not contributing much to the flavor as much as it's accentuating hop or malt character, but they also tend to be fairly high, highly attenuative. Um, yeah. So, you know, you're accentuating that bitterness even more, you're drying the beer out, which almost seems polarizing. It almost seems like you'd want something that leaves some of that malty sweetness, which, you know, if we're kind of, maybe that's the next slide, maybe it's not, but um, when we start jumping into some of the newer renditions of IPAs, right? Uh, people are starting to focus on yeast expression a little bit more, which is interesting. Yeah, it certainly is. And it's, it's really, you know, I think for most of its existence, the American craft brewed IPA was was driven by hop flavor, right? And different hop varieties. And if you, you know, when Amarillo first came out, everybody was brewing IPAs with Amarillo or when Nelson from New Zealand was first available, you know, it was very popular for brewers to use in IPAs. And I think it shifted, you know, the last few years. Um, you know, it's interesting because I, I think, I don't think people realize how dry uh, a West Coast IPA is. I mean, it's it's fermented out pretty pretty strongly, and you know, and I think you know to your point, I think you know the lack of sweetness sometimes creates a, a flavor imbalance, but the bitterness actually uh, creates a mouth watering kind of effect sometimes, and and so it just makes you want to drink more. And, and so you get that a little bit more when the beer is drier, that, that effect of just wanting to take another sip as soon as you, as you drink the first one, um, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, now it's, I mean, the last probably six, seven years, it's, it's been all about trying different yeast strains and different, different things with yeast to, to really get different flavors out of IPA. And I, th I think that's been fascinating. Yeah. And I'm probably, going to put my foot in my mouth a little bit for asking this one but uh with the beer being so dry and keen on accentuating those hop aromatics how do you feel water profile plays a role in defining the style well i think um you know for if you look across the all sections all types of ipas it's extremely important you know um uh, West Coast IPAs, the water water on the West Coast, particularly in Southern California and San Diego is very hard, right? So you get a lot of calcium and you get a lot of sulfate and all of that kind of helps dry the beer out. It's good for yeast health and it also accentuates hot bitterness, right? So it was a characteristic that was, uh, I think, a, a more regional one that people, people really think about. Um, but that water, you know, in San Diego was incredibly hard and you know, I, I don't think a lot of brewers paid a lot of attention to the water chemistry early on in, you know, West Coast and double IPA brewing and things like that. But I think, you know, obviously as, as the hazy IPAs have come into play, you know, the water chemistry is even more important and you get that high chloride ratio that really softens the hot bitterness and softens the beer. Uh, and so I think it's more important now than it ever has been, you know, um, and I think more people are paying very close attention to it. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think it really helped solidify what we view that style to be, you know, as, as very biased West Coasters. <laughs> but, you know, I think San Diego and the West Coast in particular is still always going to be the best IPA brewing <laughs> region, even if you go to the store and there's not any West Coast IPAs on the shelf anymore. But uh, I will say in the last like two weeks, I had Sublimely Self-Righteous and Wookie Jack, and I had never been more excited for uh, like callbacks to IPA spinoffs. 
I, you know, I, I saw that. I reached out to my friends at Stone and, and to Matt, and I just said, thank you for bringing these beers back. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's, it's a cool thing. I, you know, I think Black IPA gets a bad rap because the name is, is, is an oxymoron. Uh, but, you know, if you go back to what I first said, you know, when you look at IPA and defining the style, to somebody who doesn't know what IPA is, the first thing that comes to my mind is hoppiness and intense hop character. And, and certainly if you're ordering a black IPA, you know what you're getting. You're getting an hoppy beer that's dark, right? Um, and the fact that it's still, you know, the, the initial stand for pale ale really threw a lot of people into a tizzy, but it never bothered me. <laughs> and so I was like, yeah, black IPA, that's cool. You know, red IPA, brown IPA, whatever, yeah. you know, whatever color you want to make. Cascadian, dark ale, hoppy porter, whatever. It's still the same beer. <laughs> as long as it's hoppy, then you've you've got it. You can call it an IPA. And my yeah. that's just my opinion. And I know I'm not, I may not be in the majority there, but uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, the black IPA, obviously that's, that's one that was really special to me because uh, the beer that became sublimely self-righteous was the first recipe that I did at Stone that was 100% me. And uh, I really felt, um, you know, that was like my baby, you know, and I had to, I had to go out on a limb to get Greg uh, to buy into the idea. Steve, Steve was excited about it. And Greg was kind of like, yeah, everybody's doing it. And I said, yeah, like, who? <laughs> 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 and, you know, and, and so I ended up doing some pilot brewing and I really struggled with it, to be honest, you know, the first couple of brews we did on our, you know, we had a more beer one, one barrel pilot system that we used all the time at Stone back then. And everything I brewed tasted like a hoppy porter, which is not what I was shooting for, right? Mm -hmm. I wanted something that tasted like a double IPA, but was dark. And, um, I finally got it, you know, and, and it, it was, I was actually drinking a German Schwartz beer mm -hmm. and I'm going, wow, you hardly get any roast in this at all. What are they using? And um, did a little research and found out about dehusked malt, black malt. And I said, okay, that's what we're going to use in the next trial. And I remember when we tasted the beer and it had this intense, you know, piney and, and tropical fruit hop character that just really came out of the glass very strongly. I was so excited. I like ran upstairs with glasses to show people the beer and, and Greg tasted it, you know, and he was still not enthusiastic about the idea and he tasted the beer and said, okay, I'm sold. Let's do this. And it was one of the best moments uh, it's stoned for me, you know? So I, I love the fact that Wookie Jack is black out, is back out there. We're brewing a black IPA at new realm. Uh, it goes into our mix pack that, is coming out very soon uh and so it's limited quantities but it's fun to be able to still brew those once in a while yeah it's it's still one of my favorite beers and i'll i'll say this round held up for sure and awesome. i'm just i was so excited for it so <laughs> uh, just so we don't we can keep on time here but like you know talking about the the hazy ipa and, and doing some research before us chatting today you know, I, I didn't realize that your book came out seven, six, seven years ago now at this point. Yeah, I think and, it was eight now. <laughs> yeah, uh, because I remember picking it up right when it came out and thinking it was just a great resource that I hadn't seen in such a condensed form, right? There's so much information here and there and like the approach of it and the accessibility and just breaking down what really made those beers tick and, and how to replicate them, you know, as, as well as you could. But you know, a lot I think has changed with IPA because during that time, you know, looking at one of those last slides, like you would, you would go into the store and everything said IPA on it. And like yeah. you said, red IPA, black IPA, white IPA. And I'm always on the side of the consumer. I know as an industry, we create things a lot and want to hold on to them and say, this is ours. This is how we define it. This is how it needs to be defined. But really at the end of the day, it's what resonates with the consumer and what they like. And if that means putting IPA on a label of anything hoppies, what resonates and what they understand, then that's, that defines the style to me more than us sitting on a webcast like this saying, this is what this beer is. And this is what we're always going to call it. We're only going to call it a Cascadian dark ale because of the politics and the history of it. Right. Um, but, you know, since, since your book was released, there's been a shift and we see 
I think it was slow to adapt, but you saw hazy IPA. I remember uh, being able to find fresh six packs of Sculpin and it was just insanely expensive, really hard to find. And I brought it home and my mom who never really liked a lot of craft beer, you know, I always try to give her the blondes, right? Something light, yeah. something that she can, but she drank a lot of gin and tonics. And so I shouldn't say a lot. She drank <laughs> gin and tonics. And, <laughs> uh, and I had her try a Sculpin and she's like, this is amazing. This is exactly what I, what I want. And it was transformative in the sense it was the first time that I, I saw that type, type of hop profile in something, right? That was a little bit softer, a little bit more tropical fruit and not just resin and dank. And it smelled like weed and it was just really polarizing for a lot of people. Yeah. And, and since that moment, you know, we've seen such a drastic shift towards that side of hop profiles and yeast contribution, which, you know, kind of brings us to the the hazy IPA. What a, what's been your overall take to it um, in working with different yeast strains or fermentation profiles in trying to master a style that you probably thought you had already mastered? Yeah, it was a challenge. Um, you know, I was not doing recipes and creating beers for about two years. And that was when hazy IPAs really became the the category or subcategory of IPA. And I was a little bit slow to the party, you know. And, uh, you know, part of that was my West Coast bias. You know, I had spent, you know, many good years in, in Southern California and drinking a lot of IPAs. And, um, you know, and then part of that was just not really, not really being aware of, of how much potential this, the, the hazy IPA style had. Um, and, you know, it took us, after we opened, it took us about four months to try brewing one. And, and honestly, uh, there were a couple of reasons for that. Um, you know, my, my partner said it's because I didn't want to do them, which wasn't the case. Uh, it was really, I wanted to do it right. I wanted to make sure I knew how to do it, you know, and I was, I was researching and tasting and trying some different things and looking at different yeast strains and different hop combinations. And, um, you know, when we brewed the, the first one that we brewed and we added the hops mid fermentation, uh, we taste, uh, or do sniff tests on our fermenters every single day. And that's one of our one of our sensory checks that we do religiously. And you know, we dumped the hops in day one of fermentation. And I I was you know I I, I don't want to say I was skeptical, but I was concerned. And um, the next day we came in and we tasted the beer, and it was like, oh my god, there's something going on here. You know, this this has changed from you know floral into this huge orange juice character. What is going on here? And, you know, as the brewer in me and the technical brewer in me got fascinated with all of this. And, and since then, we've, we've got a series of beers that we do every year. It's called Haze Lab. And it's, uh, it's only sold in one, one account right now, but you can often find them in our restaurants. And every single batch of that we've brewed has been different and used a different technique or a different yeast strain or a different hopping regime. And it's just all this information that we were able to gather on how people are brewing great hazy IPAs. And we try to incorporate elements of those in each one of these beers. And then we've also done it in a, a lot of our beers as well. And the yeast, the yeast strain is, is huge, right? I mean, that's, that's what drives it. And, uh, you know, on the biotransformation bit, you know, I know there's some research going on as to how much the strain of yeast really contributes to that. Uh, I've seen different things. Uh, I tend to think it's it's important, uh, just based on, you know, my limited uh, testing with different yeast strains and doing mid fermentation dry hops. Uh, I do think the yeast strain is important, and I think there are certain strains that that produce more of that that ester and that and that juicy character uh, than others. But you know, I know the I know the research is still ongoing, so I'm not I'm not uh, you know, 100% in that camp, but you yeah, know, it's fun. It's, it's really fun. Yeah. It's, it's, it's awesome. And, you know, it's like, it's exciting to see people looking at yeast flavor as something that's desirable in these styles of beers. And, 
you know, because you look at a lot of the English beers and you, you get a traditional ESB and there's often this marmalade note that is yeast derived or from very, very uh, limited hopping in, in comparison to some of the beers we're doing. But yeah, we've been doing a lot of research in-house. Um, our head of R&D, uh, Dr. Karen Fortman was on the MBA podcast and they posted that in December and she was talking about some of that project and, and some of the results are still very preliminary. Uh, but I think there's going to be a lot of interesting findings. And obviously, uh, Shellhammer has been doing a lot of research on that yeah. for a long time. But, you know, it's it's in the wine world, they've been looking at, you know, the these non-aromatic compounds being enzymatically altered by yeast yeah. to become aromatic. And you look at New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc in specific and the, the, these thiols that release this awesome tropical fruit and then you kind of compare what a lot of the potential is for hops grown in that region and different yeast strains and what their capability is so you know i think the more we learn it, it's kind of interesting because it's not probably going to change the way we brew that much it's just going to help us understand to you make beer that couple percent better and 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 understand what we're doing so that we can be a little bit more consistent with it and I, I think also it's going to give brewers options that, you know, they may not know that they have right now, you know, with yeast strains or hop varieties or things like that. I think it's all really important and really valuable. And it, it's interesting. It's not just, you know, it's just not, it's, it's not just colleges that are universities that are doing these studies, you know, uh, folks like yourselves and, and uh, even hop suppliers are researching this, you know, and trying to understand, you know, what is going on and, and you know, how their products might play a role in, in making a great, great hazy IPA. It's, yeah. I've, I've loved it. You know, to me, craft beer is all about growth and change. It always has been, you know, innovation has been key to the success of craft beer. This is just another step. And, you know, I know, I know there are brewers that are, you know, set in their ways and don't want to go down this road, but for me, it's been fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. It's been pretty awesome. And, you know, there are a lot of detriments too to, to dry hopping mid fermentation. And, you know, we talk about yeast harvesting and handling yeah. and, and some of the difficulties that everybody wants to continue every other aspect of their process the same, but throw huge hop loads in on day two and three, three of fermentation. And, and, and not to mention what that high amount of vegetal mass does too, and what you might be blowing off compared to what you might be keeping too. So I think it, uh, it all kind of ties into the same matrix. And at the end of the day, though, if you can reproduce it and it, it comes out to be a tasty beer, I think that's what's most important. Yeah, exactly. So to, to kind of wrap up, uh, you know, ingredients and process are key factors in distinguishing styles, uh, but the IPA has been continued to change. And the, the last question that I pose to you is, will I, IPA be recognizable to us in another hundred years? As, you know, a hundred years ago, if you put a beer in front of them, they'd probably throw it back in the beer keeps face and say, this isn't what I ordered. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think there will be elements that that remain the same, right? I, you know, if you look at how IPA was brewed in the 1800s, the analytical specs and targets were very similar. And even though the hop varieties and the yeast strains contributed a lot of flavor, um, you know, it was a it was a beer that was very similar uh, in approach to a West Coast IPA, and. I don't think that's going to go away. I do think IPAs will continue to evolve and change, and I don't see them going away as being the, uh, you know, the the most popular craft beer style. Uh, I think I think IPAs are here for good at this point, but you never know. You know, everything's very cyclical in this business, and things come and go. But you know, it's um, I I think we'll recognize it, but we'll be surprised by it too. I guess is the short answer. Yeah. So when, when is IPA going to be the beer that somebody's dad or grandpa drank, right? I, th I think it's becoming <laughs> that right now, yeah. honestly. <laughs> yeah, I, I could see that. Yeah, I think, yeah, anyway. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, my wife and I joke, like, you know, I've got a bunch of tattoos and stuff and it's like our kids, like when they rebel, it's not going to be getting a bunch of tattoos and drinking really high alcohol, bitter beers. It's going to be something completely unrecognizable. 
so with that said, I know that you have a busy schedule. I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to chat. I think it was an awesome conversation. I'd love to to further it over a beer sometime this year. Uh, yeah, hopefully some trade shows end up happening and we'll cross yeah. paths or, or meet up at a workshop again. But um, do you have any um, parting words on a new Rome, where to find you guys, anything else you have coming on or anything people should check out? Yeah. So we're, um, we're located in Atlanta, just a couple of miles, um, um, about a mile uh, east of the downtown area of Atlanta. So we're in a very populated area, a lot of, a lot of great nightclubs and bars and things like that in, in our neighborhood. Uh, and then in Virginia Beach, we're in a, uh, about five miles away from the beach tourist area uh, in a more residential area. But we've got beautiful breweries in both locations, great food. Um, like I said earlier, we, we try to have a lot of beers on tap for people. So, you know, my goal is to make sure that anybody that's a beer drinker that comes in is going to find something they like and uh we've really really held to that and you know uh you know we're going to continue i i think we're we're doing okay in in this environment and um you know if you come to our restaurants you can be safe you know it's so we we enforce social distancing and um you know our our staff all wears uh, protective gear so you know hopefully uh when people visit they feel safe and and have a good experience that's what we're trying to do awesome good on you and uh kudos to your staff for or anybody in the service industry right now having yeah to... it's it's hard for them i you know i'm very sympathetic to what they have to go through it's it's tough yeah it's not easy and everybody's doing what they can doing a great job so yeah again great chatting with you and i hope we can catch up soon all right eric thanks a lot i really appreciate it all right thanks mitch i'll talk to you later take care